All right. Well, welcome, hello. I'm so happy to be here with all of you, even though I can't see your faces right now. Still pretty exciting. Um, my name is Jessica Moreno. I am the Conservation Science Director with the Coalition for Sonoran Desert Protection. And I was invited here to share with you a volunteer opportunity that you should be able to do um, there in the office when you have time and it can count towards your hours. Um, there's also ways to do it from home. So that gives you some flexibility and we'll work with you on how to do that. Um, what we have going on right now is our Desert Identifiers, the coalition's Desert Identifiers uh, volunteer opportunity here. We've got about 60 wildlife cameras throughout Pima County uh, monitoring wildlife for different project areas. Most of these projects have to do with wildlife corridors or linkages and helping animals get across the road safely and making sure that our um, open spaces are connected. So for example, you might be familiar with the wildlife overpass bridge um, near Catalina State Park on Oracle Road. Uh, we started monitoring wildlife there five years before construction of that project and are continuing to monitor it now. And that has really helped justify the need for the project and also show how successful it's been and how it works. Um, so we still have that project ongoing and then we have several others throughout the county that um, are doing similar things to help us connect open space for wildlife. Um, but this means that I get thousands upon thousands of photographs <laughs> that all need identified we need to know what species is in the photo. We need to know how many there are and some other little details. So that's where you come in. I can really use the help sorting through those and identifying them. Um, and then we can use that data to do all kinds of really cool things. If you um, happen to be in school and need to do a project, you're welcome to use this data for all those projects. Um, uh, and then we analyze that also in different ways um, to do the work that we do. Uh, one example I can give right away is we had a project, we have a project in Vail, east of um, Tucson on Interstate 10. If you're familiar with the Cienega Creek area, um, we had cameras in the Cienega Creek Bridge, the Davison Canyon Bridge, and then in about 10 culverts under I-10 in that stretch of protected space. Uh, what we were looking for were what animals are using those culverts, which ones were approaching and then um, avoiding those culverts. So we, we were looking at a passage rate for different species. Um, and then we also did roadkill surveys to kind of show the difference between what animals were using those culverts and what animals were really avoiding them and getting hit on the road. Um, and we found that a number, for example, a number of black bears were getting hit on the road. Um, they would use the culverts, but there was no fencing to keep them off the highway at all. So animals would just cross um, and get hit. So we're working now based on that data, we're applying that to get funding to put in wildlife funnel fencing and make that corridor much safer for wildlife passage and more efficient. So that's one example of how we're using this data. Um, there's a number of different ways we can continue to use it as time goes on and we have time to dive into the data that help us sort out and clean up. So I'll dive into it. We're gonna take about an hour. Um, and then I also wanna tell you too that I'm available as well as um, Carrie. And um, if you have any questions following the training, please reach out um, and I'm happy to answer them. That's what I'm here for. So I even have some volunteers who will be working on this at home and they'll take a photograph on their phone of the picture they're looking at and text it to me and say, what is this? <laughs> or ask me questions and that's fine too. I'm okay with that. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is share my screen and what you, let me see here, there we go. Okay, this is really exciting screen, right? <laughs> um, so what you're seeing here is a drive. And what you're gonna have in practice is a laptop that's there at the zoo that will have all of this data on it in this format. Um, 
If you're working from home, we will find a way for you to get it through email and I'll give you a download link to get um, a set of photographs. If you're working from home, you do need to have a PC computer. The program that we use to analyze and sort and store all of our wildlife camera photos is in Microsoft Access, which unfortunately um, you can't use on Apple products. So um, you will need to have a PC computer for this. Um, but again, we'll have a laptop at the zoo for you to use at any time too. Um, if you don't have Microsoft Access, because it doesn't come with the Microsoft package very often, uh, you can download a free version of it called Access Runtime. And I have instructions on how to do that and can walk you through it if needed. Um, but we'll first of all, just come into how we're gonna be sorting these photos and we can back up a little bit on that. On the laptop, and um, also printed out for you, you will have some get started how-to materials. So everything I'm gonna talk about today, I actually have written out step-by-step step so that you can refer back to it. In addition to having this training recorded, um, we have a volunteer description uh, that just describes what you're doing. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and then I have a PDF on how to ID photos that will, that's the step-by-step -step piece that I'm gonna walk you through right now. So it's written out for you. This also has a description in it on how to download that access runtime if you want to do that. Um, and then I have a number of different field guides here. Um, any kind of mammal field guide will help you if you're trying to identify um, the animal in the photograph. These particular field guides though are super handy in that they're made for wildlife cameras. So one here is, oh, it's sideways, that's great. Made by the um, Saguaro National Park for their volunteers. So it gets, it shows you actual, why is it sideways? It, it actually does show you um, wildlife camera photos and is very detailed about how to tell the difference between a mule deer and a white-tailed deer and where to look specifically for those characteristics that will tell you the difference. Um, animals don't follow the rules in field guides. So, you know, especially if you're trying to take a candid photo of it, um, you won't always get to see the antlers or get to see the tail. And so um, it's really handy to have um, something that will show you specifically uh, what to look for in that case. Um, we have a number of species that can be hard to identify um, or tell the difference between. For instance, we have two different species of jackrabbits here, the back-tailed and the antelope jackrabbit. Um, these are actually not too difficult. Antelope jackrabbits have white tails and white-tipped ears and black-tailed have black-tipped ears and black tails. So um, we're gonna go through some of those little details and you'll learn as you go. I don't want you to expect to be an expert when you start. This is something that you're gonna gain your expertise as you're doing it, um, and that is okay. Another aspect of this that I really want you to know is that how we um, set this up for our volunteers is that I send out a batch of photographs. So here's one batch. Um, this is from our uh, Sopery Wash project area, which is near Green Valley in Amato down south. And um, it's just a set of photographs. It might be a set of photos that has like 100 photos in it, or it might have a 1,000 photos in it. It depends on um, what your needs are, I guess, for um, what we're doing. And in each folder is going to be an, a folder of the images, which you actually don't have to touch. You don't have to look at that. And there will be a photo ID file. This one has already been completed by a volunteer and they've put their initials and the date in there. Um, just initials is, is sufficient when one is finished. Um, and actually Carrie and um, <clears throat> your supervisors at the zoo can handle some of this stuff. So um, the photo ID file is what you're gonna be working on. This is your access runtime uh, document. Okay, the first thing that comes up when you open it is this photo ID login. Now you are going to be the zoo crew volunteers. Rather than having each of you log in as, your, as an individual person, we're just gonna call you all volunteers together in one, um, one set. 
one way this makes this nice is that you can see which photos have been ID'd and which ones have not. So you can just work on the ones that haven't been done, especially since you're all working on the same laptop, presumably. Um, so you're gonna choose Zoo Crew volunteers um, and go. Now here's the screen that you're gonna be working in and you're gonna see um, through most of your work. What it does is it shows you um, an image from one of our camera trap photos. At the top, along the top here, is the name of the photograph. And you don't really need to know much about this other than it will tell you um, what study area it is in, which the camera name is, and what the date and time is. Um, Jessica? Yes. Uh, pardon me for interrupting, but all I'm seeing is the uh, file directory. I'm not seeing anything that, that you're talking about. OK, thank you. Let me see why that's happening. I'm going to stop share really quick and see if I can do that again. I think I'm just going to share my screen instead of an actual um, How's that? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thank All right. Thanks for letting me know that. Um, cuz you don't want to stare at my file folders all day. <laughs> all right. We got to get into the fun stuff, right? Okay, so the, here it is again. This is this is this um, window that you're going to be viewing. At the top here is the file name. Along the top bar where it's blue, um, you're not really going to need to do this because I'm giving you small batches at a time. But if you wanted to filter by location or by season, you could do that. But the most the most the thing you would use the most, I think, is this little button here, which says only images that need ID. You click that on. It will only show you the images that no one no one else has done yet, right? If you um, keep it unclicked, you'll see what other people have already said. So you can review and see what other people have said or finished. Um, but if you're just trying to chug along and get some work done that other people haven't gotten to yet, you'll want to check that box. Okay. The image here in the middle is kind of small. If there's a reason for you to want to zoom in and see some details like, what on earth is this? Is there a squirrel in here? And you want to see um, some more detail, just double click on it and it will open it into um, Microsoft uh, Photos Viewer or whatever software. Actually, it's the laptop I'm giving you has Photo Viewer. So you'll be able to manipulate it in there, zoom in and out. Um, if you want to darken the photo or lighten the photo a little bit, you can do that too. Um, for the most part, fully expect to see uh, blank photos because these cameras are all motion and heat sensing. And especially in the summertime, when it's hot, every little leaf blowing in the wind can trigger it. Um, we work really hard to make sure the settings on those cameras are um, set up in a way that to reduce that problem, but that will happen. So if it's empty, you can believe that it's empty. You don't have to work too hard to find some little moth or something that might be in the frame triggering it because more than likely um, the wind triggered it. Um, and that's okay. There isn't always something in the photograph, okay? Um, if it's blank, what we do <clears throat> is we come down here and this is the part you're gonna be working in. And now you can use a mouse. There's also keyboard shortcuts down here. Um, if you like using the keyboard shortcuts to go a little faster. Um, but the first thing we want to do, and I'm going to take this over to a picture with actual animal in it. Does anyone want to say what that is? The coyote. The coyote. Yes. So we have three different canines here in the Sonoran Desert. Um, coyote should be um, a pretty common one. You'll get a lot of that. Um, we also have gray fox, and very rarely we'll get kit fox. Um, and the field guide will tell you the difference between gray fox and kit fox. Um, a lot of that has to do with location too. So here, what we wanna do is look in the species list and it will give you a list of all the species that have previously been identified for this project. So it's pretty comprehensive. Um, if what you're looking for is not in here, you can type something in here and that's fine too. Um, 
So here we go, we have coyote. As soon as I add the species, it adds another row, just in case there's something else in the photograph. So for example, if the coyote had a pack rat in its mouth, I could also put that in um, as a second animal that's in the image. Or if it's interacting with a badger in the same frame, which would be exciting, you could put the badger in it. So we wanna list every species that we see. The detail doesn't always show up. Um, there aren't details for every species. For the predators though, we do have an option to list predation. So if, for example, this coyote had a pack rat in its mouth, I would click predation because that's occurring. But you can mostly leave those blank. This field is individual. So here you're gonna type the number of animals you see for each species, in this case, one. Um, if you have a herd of javelina, it might be seven. <laughs> so uh, you're gonna count the number of individuals that you see and put that number there. There is a field for comments, but we generally leave that blank. There's nothing um, really you have to put there. If you do put anything in the comments field, it's a way to flag it for me to see it. I will see the comments. So um, just keep that in mind. And then this is really fun. If you think this photograph is super awesome and would be great to use on social media, click this highlight button and it will let me know that you found photographs we could use for social media. Um, the rest of these, I would ignore. Advance automatically, seconds per photo. That means it will advance to the next photo in a, in a time frame you choose. Um, personally, I like to take my time looking at the images and not have a computer tell me how long I have to do it. <laughs> so I ignore those. There is an option here for batch ID. So if you have, um, say, a series of photographs and you've gone through them and they're all blank, that's the most common scenario. Or maybe you have um, a very photogenic rock squirrel in front of the camera who's just dancing around <laughs> and you've got 50 images of him. What you can do is look, search for the first image in that set and it lists them all here. So you're gonna wanna note the date and time, the image name of the first one, and then the last image in that set. And you can select the species and the number of individuals um, and batch ID them all at one time. Um, so that is an option. If you're using shortcut keys, go out of here. Um, there's also a shortcut for a keyboard shortcut for just copying the last um, the last entry that you had. So um, if you press the Z key, it repeats all the data from the last record. So you can also just go through all of the um, blanks by going Z, 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 like that too. Uh, just depends on how you like to work in your computers. Um, another, another thing you can do is if you have an image where there's an animal in there, but it might be hard to see, or there's a second animal in there that might be hard to see, and you just want to make clear where you found it, you can click once on the image, and it will create a box that says, look here, that's where the thing is that I'm looking at. You click it again and it will go away. So you can leave that there if you want, that is an option. Um, and then the rest of it is just going through all of these images and identifying them one at a time and telling us what you see in each image. Um, the next part is the hardest part, which is identifying what you're seeing, right? And if you're not as familiar with Sonoran Desert Species, there'll be a learning curve, but you'll pick it up real quick. I, I have I have every um, every confidence that you're gonna be picking it up very quickly. Um, some of them aren't gonna be super clear, especially at night, they can be a little bit blurry, um, but you're gonna start to learn uh, what's going on. Sometimes you're gonna see something like this. What the heck? Okay, I don't know. It doesn't t give you enough information, right? You can look at the image before and after and see if it gives you any more clues. In this case, it doesn't. <laughs> we don't know what that is. Um, so in that case, what we put is unknown. Unknown, all right? Um, there's also an option for 
Where is it? I think there's an option here for blank when there's nothing in there. Um, now I can't find it in my list. Maybe it wasn't included. This You'll see it in your list. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so you can put unknown. Um, and then if any of you get really good at this and you want a challenge, I can give you a batch of unknowns and you can go through and see if you can figure it out. Um, a lot of them we can't figure out and that is okay too. So um, the other great thing about this program is that you will not need to save as you go. Everything is automatically saved. So when you're done working, you can exit out of this and every all the work you've done is already saved. Um, and the next person or you coming in and opening it up again, it will just start where you left off. So you don't need to worry about saving your work. I will also say that the structure of how we do this is that I send a batch to you and then I send the same batch of photographs to somebody else. So what the database does is take your responses and correlate them together. If you agreed that was a coyote and there were one of them, then it puts that in the database and checks it off as verified. If you disagreed, one of you said it was a fox and one of you said it was a coyote or one of you said there were two of them and one of you said there was one of them. If there's any kind of disagreement, then it flags it um, for me to verify. So that means it is okay to guess. It is okay to guess. Um, just give it your best guess. If you're really uncomfortable or really don't know, you don't have to do that one. You could skip it. Um, because again, when you click this only images that need ID, the next person who comes along, it will pop up for them. Um, but I really encourage you to just try it out. Um, you're also welcome, like I said, to ask and say, Hey, you know, I'm not quite sure what this is because that's how you're going to learn. That's how we're going to figure it out together. Right. Um, let me see if I can get out of here. So yeah, you just exit out when you're done and it's automatically saved. When the whole batch is done, then we rename our photo ID file with your initials, um, or you could just put done, <laughs> something that shows that this is completed. All I need back, and um, you won't have to deal with this part, but all I need back is this piece, and I don't really need the photos back. They're all copies. So that's it. You're just gonna go through these um, batch by batch, um, looking at these different images and identifying different species. So what I want to do now, and again, all of this is written out step-by-step step in our how-to how guide. So if you forget, <clears throat> you can come in and uh, read through this again or watch this training again, okay? Um, cause I will have this all here for you as a reference, um, anytime that you need it. <clears throat> all right. What I want to do now is go through one of these mammal field guides really quick. We'll go through some common species that you're going to see, and then, um, we'll try it out and we'll, we'll see how that works in practice. Okay. So. This was created by Saguaro National Park. We have some that we've created, but there's no need to invent the wheel sometimes. Um, and we have a, quite a few different um, sets of these that you can refer to and use. We talked a little bit about um, jackrabbits. You will see um, mostly black-tailed jackrabbits being the most common. Um, the antelope jackrabbit uses a slightly higher elevation habitat but we do occasionally see them on some of our project areas like in Oro Valley. So it's good to know the difference. And thankfully it's nice that these ones are pretty easy to identify based on whether you see black or white on their ears and tail. Um, and for jackrabbits, you usually can see their ears. So that's usually not too difficult. <clears throat> Here's some more examples of uh, what to look for with those guys. Then of course we have two different species of deer here. And again, they tend to um, use different habitats. 
Mule deer are more common on most of our camera project areas, but we do occasionally see whitetail. And in the soapery project, that's one place where we see whitetail quite a bit because they do like higher elevation um, compared to mule deer. And um, they do overlap occasionally also. So for white-tailed deer, you're gonna see this white flagged tail. And when it's down, it looks like this with, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, it has this white edging on it and they kind of tuck it in, right? Mule deer have a tail that isn't fluffy and it has a black tip on it. So if you see that black tip, that's a mule deer. They also have comparatively larger ears, <laughs> um, although that can be kind of subjective. Um, and hard to tell the difference uh, without a lot of practice. Mule deer also tend to have this mask in the front of their face, um, right around the eyes, uh, whereas whitetail have a white band around their nose. So those things are things you can look for. If you see antlers, they have very different um, ways of branching their antlers. Oh, here, this, this is giving you, so this is, this is really detailed um, if you have no antlers and no tail to see, um, their metatarsals are slightly different. And so um, for mule deer, they're much longer and it's kind of hard to tell, but like, oops, sorry. Um, I just look for like that fluff, that line of fluff along the edge of the back foot um, being, being longer as opposed to shorter with the white tail. Uh, Hopefully there's enough detail there that you don't even have to get to that part. Where's my deer antler? Oh shoot. Okay. Well, I'll I'll explain it here and then I can show you a different um, picture. Um, but white tail have antlers that do fork. So um, if you can kind of see here, you can see how it's forking here. And they sort of almost curve towards the eyes. They're kind of tightly bunched together like a little crown right above the head. Whereas mule deer have much, much larger antlers that spread up high and wide. Um, and those ones, those ones um, fork upon the forks. So I'll, have to fi I'll find you a different picture so I can explain this a little bit better. But with the white tail, all the new branches come off one main beam. You can see that here with this this antler, all the branches are coming off that main beam. Uh, with the mule deer, they come off, they, they start forking. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they get larger antlers. Um, skunks, I'm gonna skip this part for right now because I have another guide that I wanna show you that's a little bit better for the skunks. But we have four different species of skunks. You could see any of the four. Um, a I'll, I'll let you know which ones are most common, uh, but I'll skip ahead and, and skip that for now because I have something else to show you for the skunks. Um, for the most part, we don't identify the difference between these two different cottontail rabbits. We just do desert cottontail rabbit. There's really no need to look at the species level of that so um, closely for the work that we do. So cottontail rabbit. <laughs> Here's gray fox versus kit fox. So Gray foxes have a black stripe down their tail. And they also have kind of like this rusty red along the ears and the side of the neck. Um, but the most important thing I think to look at is their ears and the proportional size of their ears. Because kit foxes have these huge ears. They're like one ear is almost the size of its face. Um, they also tend to be more of a sandy color and they have a black tipped tail, but it does not have that stripe down the back. Um, so hopefully the tail can help um, give you a sense. Their legs are also a little bit longer relative to the body. Gray foxes tend to be short, of, short to the ground. So that's something else you can look at. Um, let's go ahead and look at, let's see, let's go ahead and look at a um, different field guide here. I'm gonna show you the skunks. All right, so I put this together because I, uh, so many people had questions about these skunks. Um, we have, again, the four different species. One of the more common ones that you will see is the hognose skunk, uh, 
the way you can identify this one, actually with all the skunks, just look at the tails. The tails will tell you what's going on more than color or pattern. Um, Hognose skunks have a, sh a short tail. It's shorter than their body. And it tends to look like this little brushy bottle brush um, and it's solid white. So that will always be the case. Hognose skunks also have this little nose <laughs> that's pretty pronounced. So if you can see that, that will help you out too. So with hognose skunks, we're looking for a short tail and we're looking for a solid white tail and back. The spotted skunk is pretty rare. They like higher elevations and most of our uh, cameras are in lower elevations in the wildlife linkages and corridor areas, but we do occasionally see them. Um, they're very cute. They're extremely tiny. They're about the size of a squirrel. They have this little pom-pom tail and um, they're, the pattern of their striping is kind of like a fingerprint. Um, I like to say they look like gremlins, if you remember gremlins. <laughs> um, but they are very tiny. So those ones are pretty easy to identify because of their size and that little fluff ball tail. All right. Another very common one, probably the most common skunk that we get is the hooded skunk. This is in the Mephitis um, genus. And so the Mephitis skunks have a stripe coming down the center of their face on their on their nose. The hooded skunk has the longest tail. So this tail is gonna be longer than the body. It also looks pretty shaggy and unkept, if you ask me. And it comes in three different color variations. So um, identifying by color can be harder, of course. I, that's why I go by the tail. Um, but here's the three different color variations for you. There is a one that's white backed and white tailed just like the hognose skunk. Um, there's also one that's pretty black with just a few white hairs here and there. Um, and then there's one that has like a, a black with white stripes or patches on the side of the body. So again, go by the length of the tail for these guys, for all of these skunks. The other Mephitis skunk that we have is the striped skunk. So this is flower from Bambi and it's pretty uncommon here but we do get it occasionally. Um, again, it has the nose stripe, same as the hooded skunk, but this um, one has a very distinctive pattern that doesn't change. It has one color pattern, which is that it has a single white stripe that splits into two on the back and rejoins at the tail. And it kind of creates this black island on the back. Um, it's the only, so striped and spotted are the only skunks that have more than one color on their back. The other ones will have one color. And I also kind of see these ones as looking uh, more dapper and their fur, their fur isn't quite as um, un, uh, long and shaggy as you see with the hooded skunk. Um, and then again, if you look at the tail, the tail is, is short, it's shorter than the body. So um, just based on tails, you could identify the species of all of the skunks that we have here, okay? Um, I'm going to go through Saguaro National Parks and we can look at these deer a little bit more closely because um, you'll come up with this a lot. <laughs> and again, here's the tail, fluffy white tail. If they're running away, it might be flagged, but usually you'll see it down. Um, and the mule deer has that black tip. Here's looking at the antlers where you have with the white tail, a single beam, and all of the points come off that single beam. And with the mule deer, you have two main beams. You can see that fork occurring, and then from that fork, another fork. So, um, and you can see how that gets much wider. This photo also shows you pretty clearly that face mask that you see um, on the mule deer. And again, like the metatarsal um, lengths right here. So like, do you see a little dot of fluff or do you see a line of fluff? Um, here again, this is like the facial coloring. You can see um, that face mask showing up really clearly here with the mule deer. Um, sometimes with the white tail, you don't see that nose band as clearly. So it's a hit and miss that with that one. And again, like all these characteristics, you kind of just go through and check off boxes and um, see which, which one gives you the most uh, the most responses there. 
here's some photographs showing those jackrabbits with the black tail and the black ears, the antelope with the white ears and the white tail. Um, and again, too, like with these ones, uh, habitat can also give you a really good indication of which species you're going to be looking at. We see antelope jackrabbits in Oral Valley in Big Wash and Catalina State Park on our cameras. And most of our other camera sites get the black tail jackrabbit. Here's another um, field guide for the skunks. So you can kind of see that tail comparison there. Um, coyote versus gray fox. Uh, again, that's mostly color and tail length and size. Um, so those are some of the field guides that we provide here for you. Um, and regular field guides can help you too. And then again, as you're going through, you're going to you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna learn as you go. Cause you'll, you will, I promise you come up with, um, come up with species and photographs where you're like, I do not know what that is. <laughs> and that is okay. We totally expect that to happen. That's how you're gonna be learning, okay? Um, here's some fun photographs that, of examples of what you might see. So um, I don't know if you wanna unmute yourself and try to guess or, or, give a response instead of having me see, tell you what you're looking at. You want to give it a try? What do you think? Sure, that's a gray fox. Gray fox. Yes. And some people are very surprised to note um, all the reddish coloring that you can see in a gray fox. They're quite, they're quite pretty actually. Most of the photographs you're going to see of the gray fox will be at night. Um, they're pretty nocturnal. Uh, we rarely see them in the daylight hours. So again, here's another canine. What do you He's think? He's gonna be first to unmute. Female coyote. Very good. And you wanna to talk to everyone about why it's female? Uh, she's got um, breast, looks like she's been um, feeding her pups. Yeah, she's nursing. And in this sequence, we also have pictures of those pups. Pretty adorable. Um, we don't identify male versus female in our data set because um, it's not really required for the work that we're doing with the data. Um, but you can write something like that in the comments. She's nursing. Um, sometimes we get pictures like this. Any ideas? It's a bat. It's a bat. <laughs> so if you could get a clear enough photo, you can actually identify bats to species. But just saying bat is fine. Um, and this might be a case where you see something that isn't in the species list and you would write it down. How about this fellow? Avelina. 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 Do you see it? You know, shout out. Gray fox? Another gray fox, yes. And this okay. is what it would look like at night in black and white. Um, I guess the bar here is kind of hiding some of its tail, so you don't see that tail stripe quite so well. But it has um, tiny ears. It has tiny ears, yes. And you know, like this little black patch on the face and the lighter around the head. Um, kit foxes tend to be more uniformly colored. Here's another photograph of all of our friends. And then this is a case of having to go through and count how many you see. <laughs> so I see. Seven javelina? I see eight. Eight, okay. There's one, there's one leaving the frame right on the, on the, on the left here. Yeah. I mean, again, like, if you if you miss it by one, I think it will be okay. We know Havelina are going through this culvert. That's the good news. How about this one? White tail. White tail deer. Yeah, very good. How about that one? Mule deer. There's your mule deer. Thankfully, this guy is showing off his butt really well for us. So we could see his tail, um, but you could see how that ant those antlers are like 
they're going up and out. <laughs> and counting these ones are fun. <laughs> Let's see. One, two, three, four. I think I see four babies. Um, and our baby javelina are called reds by biologists often. How about this one? Take a look at that tail. That's a white tail deer. That's a white tail. So, so, um, you can see the tail does not have a black tip, even though it's kind of tucked in. Um, there's that little white band around the nose. So even though the antlers haven't started branching yet to give us any clue about um, how they're going to form, um, there's enough other detail here to tell us what's going on. How about this one? Ringtail cat? That is a ringtail. Yes. We don't get them very commonly on our cameras, but they're pretty exciting when we do. Um, we have seen on our cameras all of the different species we have in the raccoon family. So um, that includes ringtail cat. How about this one? Mule deer. Mule deer. So we have that black tip tail. There's no white band around the nose. You can kind of see that mask around the eye. Um, pretty big ears. How about this fellow? Cody Monday. Cody Monday, yes. Um, I think in the database we list them as white nose kawadi. Um, and I have I have that species list set up as common names because it makes it easier for our volunteers. But um Cody Monday is another term that is used for this one. Um, does the zoo have Coda Monday there? I'm trying to remember. No. 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 Um, yeah. Know? They're also in the raccoon family. Um, and they're really interesting because when you see them solitary like this, they're usually the male. Um, and the females and young, and then the males will join them for part of the year, will move in these huge troops all together. Um, so you could have lots of fun counting all of the kawadis moving through the frame. Uh, I've seen troops as big as like 50 or 70 individuals. We get images like this sometimes too. So this is clearly a bird and birds will be a lot of fun because they can be really blurry when they're moving through the frame. Um, for our purposes, we identify roadrunners um, and, and mostly we just say bird species. If you are a birder and you're way into the birds, um, I can send you all of the bird species photos and you can help identify them to species. If you know the species, go ahead and put it in. You can type in the species if it doesn't exist there already. Um, but if you don't, it's perfectly fine to say bird. Um, I try to add in the new species when it's something interesting or fascinating. Um, but for the most part, because what we're working on for this project is wildlife overpasses and underpasses, the birds aren't gonna be super critical for um, for that work. We do include roadrunners and if we include, if, and if we see anything else exciting, you know, like, I don't know, we, we did get a, a tanager one time. That was really cool, a paddock tanager. So we added that in. Um, <clears throat> And some things like that can be highlighted for social media. But bird species is okay. All right, how about this one? White tail. White tail. Yep. <clears throat> and again, this one has a pretty nicely shaped rack, but you could see how they're it's curling inwards, kind of towards the ears. Um Looks like a little basket on the head as opposed to branching out and up. Um, and that tail is the big giveaway. And this is that same exact deer from the front. So you can see um, how those those antlers are branching off one main beam um, and they're, they're kind of curling forwards. So that's what I have for you. Um, 
The rest of it is, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, the rest of it is just going to be like trial and error and doing it and getting good as you go. So uh, someone had a question. I thought. Yeah. Could you go back um, to the very beginning where you were showing us how to start it? Um, yeah. Because you didn't have that. You didn't have your screen working at that point. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, so what you're gonna have is a laptop available to you. Um, and in the laptop will be on the desktop of it. You know what? I've got all these little windows because I'm sharing the screen. It's a little confusing. <clears throat> um, saved there on the laptop will be um, this folder that says desert identifiers, get started. And within that folder will be all your field guides, your how-to document, um, how, how to do this with like a, a list of what to do to download access runtime if you need to. If you're working there at the zoo on the laptop, you won't need to do that at all. Um, and you won't need to worry about how to um, send me photographs. So. All you need to worry about is this section here where I go through step by step a tour of the screen and how you fill that out like we just went through. All right. Um, and then the field guides that I we've created are in here. Um, you don't have to, I won't include the volunteer waiver. You don't need to worry about that because you're already um, covered through the zoo. And then there will be folders of um, photo batches or photo modules. Um, I tend to name them according to like the area. Um, and this is just for your information, really. Um, you know, number them or name them according to um, their date and location uh, or something like that. Inside each folder is a folder of the photos. You don't need to mess with that folder at all. It's just there for reference for the access program. Um, what you need to do is open up this access program and it will be called photo ID dot ACCDR. Um, when, you're when you've completed it, you can rename it or move the whole folder into like a completed folder if you guys wanna work on it that way. I'll talk with um, <clears throat> you guys about how best you wanna handle that. Um, but just some way of indicating that this one is completed. So all you're going to do is open that folder. And then we did the photo ID thing. So you're going to be the zoo crew volunteers. Select that. And then here you go. And you can get going. Did that cover everything? Yep. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Jessica, if it's possible, we might just change the zoo crew volunteer designation to just zoo volunteer, since we're, this sounds like we're going to have a lot of our adult vo volunteers also doing this, if that's possible. That's fine. We can okay. call it whatever. Yes. Perfect. Easy to do. Um, so so we're, oh, sorry, if we're interested in working on this at home, do we let Carrie know or you know, how do we go about setting that up? I think it needs to go through Carrie at least so that we can figure out how you're getting your hours clocked through through the zoo, right? Okay. Um, and Carrie and I, we can work on that together yep. offline. Yes. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, so for the batches, can multiple volunteers use the same batch at the same time? Or is it going to only let one person in at a time? It only lets one person in at a time. So if I is bring there you- like a message that'll pop up saying something like it's already in use or something like how would we know that only one person will be in it at a time? Well, um, in practice, if it's at the zoo, there's only one laptop. So presumably one person will be working at a time. If you want to have more than one laptop or more than one station going at the same time, um, I would just make sure that people are working in different packets. You know what I mean? Okay. 
Because like uh, my thought was if someone is here using the laptop at the zoo and someone's at home and is like, hey, I want to log in to do stuff from home. Um, is there going to be some kind of like. Yeah, what we're going to do, it, what we're going to do is is send them different photographs. Then got, they it, got it. Yeah. That's how that will work. And if you have more than one station, we'll just, you know, so I have, I don't know if you can see this, I give out drives like, like, oops, there. <laughs> drives and these have um, all the photographs on them to sort um, so we can exchange those back and forth if you want to do it that way and uh, you can move the drives between computers if needed to or volunteers can take them home and then bring them back that's another way to do it um, we use um, an email file transfer service called we transfer where I can email packets of photos to folks um, but it really depends on your internet um, and how long it, how many photos there are, you know, for how long it will take you to download those. So um, sometimes just exchanging drives is more efficient, but there's, there, there's different ways to do it. Does anyone else have questions? All right. I'm super excited about this. I can't even tell you. This is super cool. Um, Amy and I just want to do this now <laughs> for our job. So yeah, right. We will just be doing photo ID from here on. <laughs> I know. Well, there is something to be said about having this this volunteer experience because there are so many research projects now that use wildlife camera data, um, and there's a huge need for this kind of expertise and work. You know. Um, a lot of different people will use, uh, or there's lots of different ways, different databases out there that people use. Um, we're using an access database that was developed by Colorado um, um, Parks and Parks and Rec, their, their uh, park service. And uh, it's been working really, really well for us. Mm -hmm. There's another one called Wildlife Insights. You can go online to their website, wildlifeinsights.org. That one is starting to use AI to help identify species. But again, it still needs volunteer help to go in there and be like, here's the difference between these things so that the AI can learn it over time um, and check it, double check it, because it does get things wrong, especially in the snoring desert. <laughs> it tends to get things wrong. So this is super helpful. Um, and it's, you know, it's, we're being, we're able to apply what you're doing to real conservation work on the ground that we're doing right now. So that's also pretty exciting. Cool stuff. Um, yeah, so I would, so like the end of the day, when you're doing this work, try to identify things to species as best as you can. Um, if you don't know, you can say it's unknown or you can skip it. Um, and, and we'll go from there. Yeah. Any last questions? I can stop the recording and we can still chat, but I'll stop the recording there. If anyone needs to get a hold of me, um, I'm at the Coalition for Snore and Desert Protection. Uh, my email is jessica.moreno at sonorandesert.org. Um, and if you send me an email, you will get, um, you, you know, my response signature has phone numbers and ways to contact me there too. So um, you can do that also. And I right. will say we probably won't start this until um, after like July 4th. So we'll give you some time to mull over that way, Jessica We'll be back in the office and we'll be ready to go. So we won't have a computer until then and we won't start doing any at home stuff until after then. But in the meantime, if you are interested in doing this, please send Amy or and or me um, just an email to let us know so that we can have a list and then we can start coordinating everything. Any other questions for anybody? All right, I'm gonna stop the recording there. <laughs>